Buy your stat 66111 Skills for the rest of your life Bootstraps and probability It's the bread and butter, baby, what's your jam? Welcome to another lecture of Bio 6611. It's the bread and butter baby. What's your jam? We'll delve in for this one into discrete distributions and we're going to review and introduce again some of the ideas of discrete distributions, the expected value, variance, and standard deviation. We'll first look at random variables and redefine them. We'll see this come up a few times throughout the next few weeks and then we'll give some specifics about PMFs and CDFs and show graphically and with notation statistically what those mean, as well as introduce and do some examples of the expected value or mean, variance, and standard deviation of these distributions. So random variables. Random variables and probability distributions are the theoretical or mathematical representations of data values and frequency distributions. The random variable is a variable whose values depend on some random phenomenon. Possible values then represent the possible outcomes of a yet to be performed experiment or things that may happen in reality. We'll call this set of possible values the sample space. Essentially, if something doesn't live in the sample space, we can't observe it with a given random variable or corresponding distributions that we'll be talking about in the coming weeks. Some notation that we'll be using and trying to use throughout the course consistently is that capital letters will represent or denote a random variable. And then the lowercase letters will represent some realization or actual observed value or uh, point of that random variable in the sample space. The probability distribution describes the probabilities for each outcome for both discrete random variables which we're talking about in this lecture and this week which we call then probability mass functions or PMFs which we'll see a little later on or the probabilities of values that may occur in a range of possible values if we have a continuous random variable that we'll touch on more next week. And those have slightly different terminology with what we call a probability density function or PDF. The PMF or PDF though is a useful tool for describing the frequency distributions of the random variables for the entire population of interest and to help us provide some probability statements about events involving random variables. And so as we mentioned, we'll be focusing on discrete random variables. So it is sort of what it sounds like. It's a sample space that is a discrete list of values. So it has to be um, either finite or countably infinite. Um, so for example, we'll let x denote a random experiment of flipping a coin. The possible outcomes are heads or tails. And so we have a finite space of outcomes in this case too. In other cases, we may count, let's say, the number of heads we get in some number of total experiments. And so there we can imagine if we did 10 experiments, we may have up to 10 heads. Or in our sort of theoretical way of talking about things sometimes, if we did infinite coin flips, we could in theory count up to infinite heads, and that's where we get this idea of countable infinity. Ultimately, with these discrete random variables, though, we're going to characterize them in sort of this basic way common across all the different types of discrete random variables and distributions with a probability mass function, or PMF. It's the function that gives the probability that x is equal to some given value or values in the sample space. The values must be non-negative and they must sum to 1. And so some notation we'll see here um, is something like the probability or big P of x equals little k is equal to some function that depends on k. So that's going to be our PMF. And again we'll see in some other lecture slides that we actually have some named and known distributions we could use for those. Also then k, that lowercase one, is that realization of a value and that is things that comprise the sample space. So above heads or tails or some number of events um, depending on our context.
So let's dig a little deeper into PMFs and CDFs in a few examples and see what those look like and also introduce the actual definition and terminology for what a CDF even is. So our PMF again, we're going to let x be that random variable and let lowercase x represent the sample space or those values that our random variable x can take on. Therefore, our probability of distribution of x may be written in a few different ways in the literature and out in the wild. Um, we see here one way is this probability of x or lowercase p of x. We also sometimes will see something that looks like capital P of x equals little x, so that random variable equaling that realized uh, value from the sample space. And there's also a few other things you may see out and about, including uh, PR instead of just P alone for probability. But let's consider a simple example here of what a PMF might look like in a few different ways. And we'll say X is a random variable that's equal to the number of colds in a year caught by a healthy adult. For the sake of this example, we'll assume our sample space has three possible outcomes, either no colds, one cold, or two colds. And what we see over here, where I'm drawing our little box around, is that each one of these has a probability of occurring um, in a given year. So if you're a healthy adult, based on maybe some previous sample or study that was conducted, we would say you have a 50% chance of having no colds caught, a 40% chance, uh, or 0.4 a probability, of having one cold, and only a 10% chance of having two colds. Again, remember our little note here, all of these probabilities are in fact non-negative and so if you're ever just given a distribution to look at if any of those probabilities are negative that's an immediate red flag and we can also note that if we add up 0.5 plus 0.4 plus 0.1 that sums to 1. One nice thing about these discrete distributions is that there's a handful of ways we can graphically illustrate them and instead of having to write out all these probability statements and we see that here at the right with this example where we have our x-axis having the number of colds and then the probability of observing that lowercase x, 0, 1, or 2, um, on our y-axis. Related to the PMF though, or the probability of a specific event occurring, is what we call the CDF, or the Cumulative Distribution Function. This again is something that sort of describes, you know, it is what it sort of describes or sounds to be. Um, and so we see here is we have some mathematical notation and frequently we'll see the CDF is represented for a distribution such as the binomial, the normal distribution, a Poisson distribution, has some examples of named distributions you may have heard of. The CDF will be represented by a capital F. The PMF or PDF we saw, we'll see you next week, um, is typically represented by a lowercase f. What we see here is that the subscript capital X denotes that it is our random variable, and we have the lowercase x in the parentheses for that realization of a value. What the CDF says is that for that given value of little x, um, what's the probability that we will observe that or something smaller than that? in our sample or based in our data. Because this is discrete, we can also actually write this out as just the summation of x equals 0 up to whatever k may be, depending on the context, and actually add up those different values from our table. A few facts about the CDF is that it's monotone increasing. That means that as we go from negative infinity to positive infinity, we're always going to be increasing in value. We will never decrease um, in that value. It may stay constant at a certain value as we see in the figure at the right that we'll walk through in a second, but it'll never sort of dip back down and have a decrease in the cumulative probability. Because of this property, we can also note that just theoretically speaking, if we observed a value of let's say negative infinity, um, it would be equal to zero. And if we observed a value of positive infinity, it would have to be equal to 1. So just remembering from our previous colds example, we have the probability mass function as defined here. And so we can see then converting this down below into the CDF at a value of 0 colds per year, 1 cold, or 2 colds, um, 
illustrates this idea of summing up those values from the PMF. So the CDF at 0 equals 0.5, or the number of colds you have is none or less, in this case really just none. The CDF of having one or fewer colds is 0.4 plus 0.5, so those two uh, PMF probability values added together. And once we have two colds uh, observed, that really represents, in this case, the entire data set. We can see graphically what this represents, where the open face circles represent values um, where there is a jump in our distribution. So we see here at zero, it jumps from being a probability of zero up to that 0.5 value we observed. Because it's discrete, there is actually no events occurring in the space between 0 to 1. You can't really have 0.6 of a cold, we'll say. Um, but then once we do hit one cold, we see the same open circle. So we jump up to the filled in circle here, representing our CDF value of 0.9. And we see that similar pattern to then going over to two colds and then jumping up to that value of 1. We'll also see this as well. Um, I think it's a little more intuitive when we talk about continuous distributions, but the general idea is the same thing. It's the cumulative sum of everything equal to or less than what was observed. And so just to provide another example to expose you to, um, let's assume x is a random variable that is the number of episodes of ear infections in the first two years of life. We see in this case, our sample space isn't uh, 0, 1, 2, but actually goes up to 6. We then also see that there is different probabilities associated with each one of these possible events, where if we graphically take a look at our PMF over here at the left-hand side, we see that 1 and 2 are similarly pretty much the most prevalent um, number of expected ear infections that you may have in the first two years of life. Um, and then 0, 3, 4, 5, and 6 have their own associated probabilities. Likewise, if we wanted to quickly know what's the probability, let's say, of having three or less uh, ear infections in the first three years of life, we could then take our CDF and realize if we go back over to approximately that uh, area on the y-axis, it's around maybe 0.85 or 85%. Conversely, since we have the data, we could also add it up uh, for 0, 1, 2, and 3 uh, probabilities. So let's shift gears slightly and talk about some of the important ways we summarize and describe distributions by using what we call the expected value, or more commonly we would describe it uh, as the mean or the average, as well as the variance and the standard deviation, which is frequently abbreviated SD. So for this lecture, again, we're focusing on our discrete distributions. And we'll see next week as well when we talk about continuous distributions, uh, they have their own formulas we can use to calculate a given uh, expected value or variance for a set of data or distribution. The, one of the most common though, ways we do summarize these distributions is through that expected value, mean, or average. So if we have some discrete random variable x, like we had with our example of the number of colds or the number of ear infections, we can actually calculate what we expect the average uh, number of colds or ear infections to be based on this formula here. And we actually have just written it in two different ways to represent the two different ways we commonly might see the probability um, represented. But because it's discrete, what we see here is that we really have some algebraic um, summation happening. And so we have the sum here um, of across all values of x, so that sample space of x that we have could possibly observe, and then we'll simply take whatever those observed values of x are, our little x is there, multiply it then by that probability that the random variable is equal to x, and that will represent our, the mean for our random variable, or as we will also commonly see it written as the Greek letter mu. So let's try actually applying this to the number of colds example. I'll give you a second here to pause the video if you'd like to try doing it on your own first, and then we'll walk through it together on the screen for what the calculation would look like in the steps. <laughs> 
Okay, now that we've had a chance to work through that problem, let's see what it is together. So again, we're really follow following the formula as presented on the screen here. And so really it's a matter of just plugging in the appropriate parts now that we know which each one of them represents. So we can see here that we have our first value of x uh, that we might have in our sample space is 0. So we have 0 times the probability that x equals 0, or 0 0.5, plus 1 cold times the probability of 0.4, plus then the chance of having 2 colds times the probability of 0.1. So we see here then we have 0 plus 0.4 plus 0.2, and so our average should be 0.6 colds per year. And of course this just represents the average because again, sensibly we can't actually experience a partial cold, um, but from our sample or the population we would expect on average any one person if randomly selected who was a healthy adult to have 0.6 colds per year on average. So what are some other ways that are important to describe the data we have? And one of the other major ways we use to describe the data besides the center or mean or average of the distribution is the variability. And frequently the way we'll do this is through what we call the variance. And it can be described as the expected value of our random variable x minus whatever the true mean is squared. Now that's a bit of a mouthful and so we can represent it in a statistical uh, notation here where we see that we have the variance of x um, also sometimes represented just v of x and those are going to be equal to what we frequently uh, denote as sigma squared or the lowercase Greek letter sigma squared. Now putting into uh, statistical notation what's said above it's the expected value of our random variable x minus the observed true mean, e of x that we calculated on the previous slide, squared, or as we see written out here just for sort of conclusion, x minus mu squared and its expected value. Now admittedly this is a little obtuse um, and so fortunately for what we're working with right now we actually have some specific formulas where we can leverage this idea but actually apply the concepts uh, we already have covered in class or may have seen in a previous statistics course. So much like the expected value, we have the ability to uh, use a formula that we can sort of plug these pieces of information into and then arrive at our estimated variance sigma squared. So we see here again it's the, going to be the summation over all possible values of x in our sample space. We then have our x minus mu, that mean we calculated previously squared times the probability of observing that value. Now one of the interesting things I'll say about the variance is that the units of the variance are the square of the units of the variable itself. So if we were measuring people's height and feet, the variance is actually in feet squared. So it's not necessarily the most intuitive way um, for people to sort of think about variability, which leads us to the next slide. Another common way to summarize the variability is with what we call the standard deviation. And fortunately, this equation is pretty simple. It's just the square root of that variance on the previous slide. And so much like uh, taking the square root of something that is squared, we see here that we end up with the standard deviation frequently being represented by just the lowercase Greek letter sigma um, for our random variable or population. And the big advantage of the standard deviation is that it has the same units as the variable itself instead of being in those squared units. So again, if we were measuring people's heights, whereas the variance is in feet squared, the standard deviation is actually in feet. And we'll see this in our cold example on the next slide. So let's give you a chance now to pause your video if you'd like to work through applying this formula now um, and then we'll walk through it together in the following few minutes. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to either 
work through the problem or at least follow along now and jot this down in your notes. And so we'll see here that we're going to leverage again the fact that we'll make our note here uh, that mu was equal to that expected value of 0.6 colds per year. And so we see here then that we'll take our first sample space value 0 minus 0 0.6 squared times 0 0.5. And then we really follow the same pattern plugging in the values as appropriate um, for each thing from our PMF or what we've calculated previously. And I forgot the little squared there. And then we have 2 minus oop, 0 0.6 squared times 0 0.1. So now we see we've written out this entire formula by hand. Um, we can then write out what this should be equal to here of 0 0.36 times 0 0.5, 0 0.16 times 0 0.4, plus um, 1.96 times 0 0.1. And then if we add all of these together and multiply them, what our variance will be is 0 0.44. And if we want to be very specific, colds per year squared. Again, not the most intuitive, so we may want to represent our standard deviation of x, which is just that uh, square root of the variance. And so here we will see it's 0 0.44 square root and it'll be approximately 0 0.66 colds per year. Now one thing we didn't know in the previous slide as well is that there's actually a couple ways we can calculate the variance and one of these is a potential shortcut that may be beneficial um, when you're working with some of these terms in the future or in theory. So in addition to the definition of the variance previously defined, um, we can also calculate it if we happen to have not just the expected value of x, but the expected value of x squared. And so we see here there's this nice relationship where the variance of x is equal to the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. So we can just briefly note here, applying this, and if you'd like to pause at this point, you can try calculating e of x squared and then plugging it into this formula, but we'll walk through it as well just to see what we get and to make sure our answer does match. What we see here that makes it similar to the formula we saw before is that instead of plugging in just 0 um, times 0 0.5 plus that 1 cold per year times 0 0.4 plus 2 colds per year times 0 0.1, we're looking at x squared. So we can imagine that we simply tack on a squared to each one of those x uh, terms there for our random variable. With that done, then we can sort of do a few shortcuts. We know that 0 times anything is going to be 0 anyway. 1 times itself is 1, so we still have 0.4. But at least then we have here um, 4, 2 squared is 4 times 0.1 or 0.4. And so we'll get then a expected value of x squared to be equal to 0.8. And therefore, if we plug it into our formula, we have the variance of x squared, which will then be, or excuse me, variance of x uh, will be equal to 0 0.8 minus 0 0.6 squared, so that expected value of x squared. And then if we do the math there, we should see that it similarly equals the variance we found before of 0.44 colds per year. So this slide is just to wrap up this set of lecture notes. And it's just a summary of the formulas we had for the expected value of our random variable x, the variance of x, or the standard deviation of x. And so we'll see some of this applied throughout the semester, but leverage more so um, in the coming weeks and throughout the rest of the semester some named distributions that already have these properties largely at our disposal or easily looked up.